May I speak to Red, please? This is him. How can I help you? So, uh, this is Howie Hawkins. Hi. Oh, hi. How are you doing, sir? Good. Good. Um, just a real quick heads up. Uh, my phone call is going to be recording this. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, well, uh, thank you sincerely for taking the time to speak with me. Um, do you mind if I just uh, get straight to asking some questions for, in the interest of time? Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Appreciate it. Um, so, honestly, uh, I'd like to start with something slightly related to my blog's main subject matter, which is pro wrestling. Um, I know that's a little probably out of your wheelhouse, but um, so I was told by your media uh, co uh, coordinator, um, Robert Smith, that you uh, were used to be a big boxing fan at one point. Um, so to tie that in, I'm unsure of your thoughts on pro wrestling, but um, I know Mike Tyson, for example, has appeared in WWF back in the day and actually is currently working alongside AEW. And I was curious what your thoughts are on the fact that the two major U.S. companies that are running right now, um, which is AEW and WWE, um, are literally running mid-pandemic, and especially when there's proof that one of them, WWE, uh, allegedly bribed a Florida politician to actually enable that to happen. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Well, are, they're violating social distancing? Uh, yes. So they, uh, they've they been running empty arena, which means no fans, but they um, – and only one of the companies, AEW, has reportedly been doing any actual testing, but they are still running shows. And, I mean, the fact of the matter is even the testing is not 100 percent accurate, and, I mean, they can't guarantee safety, and there's no social st distancing when you're wrestling with someone. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, you know, if they're putting their uh, performers at risk, that's wrong. Okay, fair enough. Um, and honestly, in a related follow-up, I was curious. Um, I know you're obviously pro-union. Uh, I know there are a lot of wrestlers, specifically uh, David Starr is one of the biggest proponent. But um, the fact that, in my opinion and a lot of other wrestlers' opinions and fans' opinions, is that the, the company, the industry in, in general, kind of needs to start unionizing what advice would you give to wrestlers who are looking to consider at least starting to move towards a union, especially with the climate, the way things are, and the fact that even mentioning that U word can get you blacklisted? Well, yeah, do it on a QT. Uh, shop around, talk to some of the unions that might be interested in organizing that field. I talked to the other, you know, pro athlete unions and, uh, <clears throat> You know, don't show your hand until you're ready to get recognized. Gotcha. So keep low until basically you're ready to pull the trigger 100%. Yeah, it's like uh, Nancy Pelosi not bringing a bill to the floor until she knows she's got the vote. Fair enough. You, know, you, you don't want to pick a fight you're not ready to win. Very fair enough. All right. Um, now, um, admittedly, while you already have my uh, – personally have my vote locked in and have for a while – uh, and the party itself uh, has had my vote locked in for quite a while. Um, I was hoping to mainly focus on, um, since most of the people that are reading this will probably not be Green Party supporters, since sadly the party doesn't have quite the uh, the following as as obviously you and spe especially you would like. Uh, I guess the and I guess since uh, I should probably be exposing them more anyways. Basically, explain why in November someone should vote for you instead of someone like Biden. Well, I think uh, some of your readers may have uh, been sympathetic to Bernie Sanders. So yes. they probably want Medicare for all. They want a full-strength Green New Deal. They want uh, programs that will enable everyone's kids to go to college. And if you're for those kinds of things, uh, you vote for Biden – you're actually voting for somebody who's opposed to those things. You vote for the Green candidate, uh, you're making your voice heard. You vote for Biden, you get lost in the sauce. It looks like you're supporting what he stands for. And if you supported what Bernie was for and, and the other things the Green Party's for, you should make yourself heard. Don't waste your vote. Make it count. Fair. And um, with the Vote Blue No Matter Who movement, uh, which basically excuses all of Biden's flaws simply because he's not Trump, um, and honestly, that same rationalization that has kept the party itself complacent and generally useless, 
Uh, do you think that this kind of mentality exists because of the way the American public has been told that there's really only two choices? And honestly, do you feel that there's any actual moral excuse to vote Biden, especially with the credible rape allegations, his current moderate stances and his terrible track record in general? Well, I think you should use a vote to send your own message. Um, now, one of those messages is the, we could be, and I would understand this, that we got to get rid of Trump. Yes. And that's like your highest priority. Yes. The problem is you get rid of Trump and we're back to the status quo with all the problems it had, a climate meltdown, growing inequality, which has led to declining life expectancies for the working class in this country in recent years. And there's a new nuclear arms race. We're getting out of all these treaties. We're modernizing our forces. The Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists has put the doomsday clock the closest they've ever had it to midnight. Yes. And, you know, Biden hasn't said a word about that. None of the major party candidates have. These are things we're trying to put forward. So um, I can understand why people are going to vote for anybody but Trump. But, you know, your vote is worth more than that. It's more than just saying no to Trump. Say yes to what you want. I agree completely. Um, how would you combat the Red Scare mentality that is still strong today, especially thanks to the poor education system that does a great disservice in actually explaining what socialism is, since everyone wants to assume that's the same thing as communism, while not even understanding what that is? And um, what would you say to the fact that the closest mainstream allies, quote unquote, um, are the likes of Sanders and AOC who are known for taking the progressive ideas and honestly, since they're in the DNC, watering them down to fit that moderate party, especially with policies like the Green New Deal, as we've seen? Well, I think things have really changed with respect to socialism. Now, some people are still scared of the word. Yes. But it used to be a conversation stopper for everybody. You just didn't even want to use the label. I mean, Sanders didn't start out in 2015 as a socialist, he was asked if he still was, and he didn't back down. And that helped open up the whole discussion. So now it's a conversation starter. And I think what we got to do is explain to people that democratic socialism, the democratic in front of socialism was put there after the Russian Revolution became, you know, a communist dictatorship. So that distinction was has been drawn for a long time, except in this country, because it's been taboo to even talk about. That's why people don't know it. So I think we have an opportunity to educate a lot of people. The other thing I think is the more Trump rants about it and calls Democrats socialists, the more people are pushed away from Trump and, and wondering, well, what is this socialism about anyway? And actually, as Bernie has articulated it um, in his programs, it's really more the old-fashioned New Deal liberalism. Yes. You know, he wanted to tax the billionaires to fund his social programs. Traditional socialists would say you got to do more than that because if you leave the wealth in the hands of the billionaire class, that translates into concentrated political power and they can resist and roll back your social programs. You need an economic democracy with social ownership of major means of production and democratic administration of them so that uh, there's more equitable power in the society, both with respect to economics and politics. Yes, sir. Fair. Uh, I agree 100 percent. And um, if you don't mind now, I actually had a few people send me some questions that they wanted me to ask. Is that OK? That's fine. Um, the first one is from Danny Mira. She uh, wanted me to ask uh, if you could explain what your foreign policy uh, priorities, especially uh, with regards to Latin America, would be and what you see as the role in the United States in that region. Well, we should be good neighbors, not imperialist, uh, you know, dominators. So it's none of our business to tell Venezuela who their president should be. And uh, what I would do generally in foreign policy is reduce the tensions with deep cuts in military spending. I'm calling for a 75% cut. We would still have the largest military force in the world. I would start bringing our troops home from these seven shooting wars. We're still engaged in the endless wars from over 800 foreign military bases. And then with respect to nuclear arms, I would pledge no first use by our country and disarm to a minimum, minimum credible deterrent. And then go to the other nuclear powers and say, we want complete and mutual nuclear disarmament. 
now that the tensions have been reduced. And we will have 122 nations that agreed to the text of a treaty three years ago called the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Because the rest of the world is scared to hell of this uh, nuclear arms race. Yes. And I think world public opinion and our reducing the tensions would put the other nuclear powers in a position where they have to start negotiating with us. And I think we can reduce the nuclear arms and beyond that, uh, arms in general. And uh, the other thing is we've got to stop making arms exports a major industry. I think the arms industry should be nationalized. It shouldn't have a profit motive. It should be a public utility that, you know, we use as we need it, but not something where the arms makers are promoting war because that increases their business. Yes, sir. Um, I had another question. This is from an activist from Katy, Texas. Her name is Mary Belchek. She was wondering, do you feel the country can truly be turned around, and do you f- agree that breaking up the two-party system is the sole way to ach- achieve true progress? And uh, adding on to that, is 5% your goal here, or are you seeking bigger aspirations realistically? I do believe the country can be turned around. And watching what's happened over the last 10 days, yes, we've never had such a multiracial outpouring of, uh, you know, cries for justice and people wanting real change, particularly young people, and they're the future. Yes. So, yes, we can turn it around. And then as far as the two-party system goes, I mean, it's a very sophisticated way for the corporations to rule because it gives us the illusion of choice. And when the election's over, you've really had a choice between anti-abortion Republican and and, uh, pro-choice Republicans. I mean, because that's what the Democratic Party has become. It's become a conservative party in yes. economic foreign policy. So we need a multi-party system that truly reflects the full spectrum of public opinion. And the way to get there is for presidential elections, get rid of the Electoral College and have yes. a ranked choice national popular vote, where you rank the choices, one, two, three, and you eliminate the last place candidate. If nobody got a majority in the first round, transfer their votes to their second choice, and you continue that process till somebody gets a majority. And then you can use the same ranked choice system in multi-member districts to get proportional representation in Congress so that if the Greens are 20% of the population, we get 20% of the seats. And if the Democrats are 30% or 40%, or same with the Republicans, that's their share. But everybody's in the legislature, in the Congress, in our state legislatures, on our city councils, in proportion to the support they have, so that uh, the parties like the Green Party, which does support, you know, has majoritarian support for many of our issues like Medicare for All, uh, that gives us a foothold in the, in the political system. And the other thing that happens is when you have a multi-party system, you don't get the gridlock you get with a two-party system, where it's a zero-sum game. So instead of coming together and solving problems, they're scoring political points on each other, and it pays to go negative. Yes. So you may look bad throwing dirt, but the dirt gets on the other guy, and uh, so it's a downward spiral. So a multi-party system will be more constructive and uh, open to negotiation and compromise toward real solutions. So I think that's key. And as far as 5% goes, that is a threshold that the uh, Federal Election Commission has for what they call a minor party yes. that is entitled to public funding for their general election four years later. So if we get over 5% this time, we'll get over $10 million to run our general election in 2024. The FEC defines a major party as 25%. So the major parties get it's now over it's about $103.7 million, $103.7 million. But they don't use that money because they're spending billions. Yes. And if you accept that money, that you can't take private money in the general election. And the last person to do that was McCain. So that, they just don't do that anymore. So it would be great if we did that to keep that uh, public funding system alive. But uh, we have other benchmarks, like about 40 of the states. The presidential vote we get determines whether the Green Party will have a ballot line for the next election cycle. And having a ballot line makes it a lot easier for us to run candidates. So in a lot of states, it's like 5% of your party enrollment in a district. So like in a congressional district, that might be 50 or 100 signatures. But if you have to petition as an independent, it's thousands of signatures. It's 3,500 in New York. 
it's over 15,000 in Illinois. It's over 20,000 in Georgia. Oof. And uh, that's a barrier that in some cases, like Georgia, they, they haven't, I believe, they haven't had an, a third-party congressional candidate on the ballot since World War II, since before World War II. And that's as far back as I know. I mean, before then, it was pretty much a all-white Democratic Party, and the Republicans had trouble getting on the ballot. Hmm. So um, the 5% is, is one benchmark, but it's, it's not our primary goal. Our primary goal is to get our issues into the debate, get as many votes as we can, get ballot lines for the next election cycle, and organize so we come out of this election as a stronger organization than we went in. Yes, sir. Um, I have a question from Tim Bingham. He's from the uh, Houston area. He's asking, um, let's see, as a proponent for true universal health care, how would you get such a thing done when the interest groups have such a stranglehold over the health care industry? Well, we got to uh, keep pushing. I mean, we have won the argument on that. The people are for it. The yes. problem with our political system is public opinion doesn't translate into public policy. I mean, we've had four states now where the Democrats were for single payer or universal health care, Medicare for all, on paper. And they would vote for it until they actually got control of both houses and the governorship. And then suddenly they had problems. This happened in Hawaii, it happened in California, it happened in New York, it happened in Vermont. So, I mean, that's another argument, you know, vote for the Greens and make the Democrats pay for not carrying through on their promises. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a combination of staying active in the social movements, and then on election day, don't get taken for granted. Don't just give your vote away to somebody who's opposed to what you want, like Medicare for all. You've, you've got to make the Democrats pay for breaking those promises. And maybe that'll turn them around. But I'll give you an example. I got 5% of the vote running against uh, Andrew Cuomo for governor in 2014. Yes, in the he New York seat, right? Run, yes, in New yes. York. And he had wanted to run up the vote to get ready to run for president. He wanted to get more votes than his father, Mario Cuomo, ever got as governor. He wanted to get more votes than he first got when he was first elected in 2010. And he got less. And he had called himself a social liberal but fiscal conservative up to that point. After that, he said, oh, I'm the progressive, uh, the pragmatic progressive. <laughs> and he adopted and enacted three things we had been campaigning for that he had never supported before. And that included a ban on fracking, uh, $15 minimum wage, and paid family leave. So you don't have to win the office to have influence. And people need to understand that, uh, you know, if we make the Democrats who say they're for single payer compete for our votes, uh, they may realize they better enact it or they're going to lose more votes. So Fair. I think there's a path forward on on that, on universal health care. Fair. Um, the next question is actually a fusion of questions, just in the interest of time. Uh, so it's going to be slightly loaded. Uh, it's going to be a fusion from uh, international drag king and anarchist Danger Pickle and D.C. resident Myron. Um, so to paraphrase, to put it mildly, when the country is currently hurting so bad, if you were in charge right now, how would you be handling things? And with the protests that are being propelled by once again unearthed systematic racism that our country has deep in our DNA, what immediate actions do you think are needed right now to provide a path forward in giving a voice to the workers, the Black Lives Matter movement, and everyone else that is constantly treated like second-class citizens in this nation? Well, if I was in the presidency right now, yes, sir. Um, with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic, yes, I would test, trace, and isolate. Damn it! I mean that is what they've done in all, all, in all the Pacific Rim countries. You know, from New Zealand up to South Korea, have done that and suppressed the infections. We have four percent of the world's population. We got thirty percent of the infections and the deaths. I mean that is, but the the two governing parties are presiding over a failed state. You know, Trump is indifferent and incompetent, but Biden is invisible and incoherent. He's not putting forward clear alternatives. So I think, you know, use the Defense Production Act to get that test, trace, and isolate program up and running, and then we can go safely back to work. Um, as far as the racism goes, uh, right now people are crying for justice, appealing to the power structure. And I think if we're really serious about uprooting racism, we got to uproot the racists. In other words, there are 
gatekeepers. Yes. They are they're cops. They are real estate agents that segregate us. They are uh, judges and uh, lawyers that administer a grossly un unequal criminal justice system. They're employers that discriminate and so forth. And, you know, the answer to white supremacy in black communities is black power. And we need to empower oppressed communities so they control their police, their schools, their housing, their businesses. And I think the way you deal with racism, I mean, people with racist attitudes, you're not going to reform them, particularly the older folks. I mean, they just, that's just is ingrained. What you got to do is give power to the people that are oppressed by racism. And so that involves things like I've been saying with respect to what we should be demanding now. Yes. When we go out in the streets and say we want end police brutality and we want, you know, equal justice under law, we got to have community control of the police where instead of now the police policing themselves, you know, when there's alleged misconduct, they investigate, they lead out any sanctions. We often don't know what they did. We should have an elected police commission that hires and fires the police chief, can investigate and sanction officers for misconduct. That's an example of how we empower oppressed communities. to So they're not racially oppressed. Yes. They get the racists out. I think that's what we need to realize. I mean, people talk about institutional racism as if there aren't people administering it. There are. And I think that's, you know, you get community control of the police, you can weed out the racists and the sadists and the ones that are disturbed because you have the power to fire, hire and fire. So, you know, with respect to racial justice, I think that's key. And the same thing goes for workers. You know, we need to organize our unions. Um, we need to uh, develop uh, forms of enterprise where we get the full fruit of our labor. I mean, right now, typical capitalist firm, you get a fixed wage. And whether you shirk or you work hard, you get that wage. And whatever extra value you create goes to the people that own the enterprise. And that's value you created. Yes. So you're being stolen from every day. So I think one, you know, cooperative, worker cooperatives can do that. Public enterprises can do that so that people get the full value of their labor. And uh, so that's that, I think, is the kind of uh, structural change in the economy we need to move towards so that workers actually do have power in a democratic economy. The uh, the next question is actually from a family member that wanted to stay anonymous because they work in the oil and gas field. Um, but he was wondering, as a leader, how would you help the industry transition to greener options without ruining the t tough balance that's currently in place and risk putting companies out of business, such as uh, the ones in Houston, which could devastate the, that entire community? Well, in the Green New Deal that we're talking about, there's a just transition program. So everybody working in the industry, uh, if they lose their job because we're moving away from oil and gas to solar, wind, and other renewables, they are guaranteed five years of current income and their benefits as they make the transition to these other fields. And in this budget, I have a budget on my website. We calculated what it would cost to get to 100% clean energy and zero to negative greenhouse gas emissions in a decade by 2030. And there are 38 million jobs to do that. And so there are more jobs. In fact, when we released it, the problem was, where are we going to find the workers? It wasn't the problem with technology. We got it. It wasn't the problem with the money. We can find it. It was the problem of finding people to do the work. Now that we're in this COVID pandemic and a lot of people are working for, looking for work, uh, you know, maybe we'll be, labor won't be so much of a bottleneck. So, and then as far as the companies that are producing oil and gas, um, they're already headed for the tank. Yes. Their stock prices have collapsed. And as we move more and more toward renewables, they are going to have lots of stranded assets. I mean, they're just not a viable business anymore. So, you know, investors took the risk of capitalism. It's risk and reward. In this case, yeah, you know, you, you, it's a loss. And I don't think we should bail them out. But we should make sure everybody working in the industry is taken care of in the transition to new work. Very fair. Um in the interest of time, since I know uh, I only got you a couple more minutes, I, one of the big things I wanted to ask is if someone is hearing this and they would like more info on uh, how to help you campaign, where should they specifically go? Where would you want them to go f first? 
<clears throat> my campaign website, which is www.howiehawkins.us. So it's H-O-W-I-E-H-A-W-K-I-N-S, one word. And U.S. is like us, Corey, United States. Yes, sir. So howiehawkins.us. And on there you can find, uh, you can volunteer. You can get on our, our list to get our you know, messages about what we're doing. Uh, you can donate. And uh, you can read a lot more about you know, what we are talking about in terms of policy. Yes, sir. And uh, lastly, if you don't mind, uh, there's a lot of scared Americans out here right now for a variety of reasons. Uh, reaching across the aisle and, and also to the people that already are supporters and just everyone in general, what message would you like to end this on? Well, I think we can come together. I think most Americans want to come together. The, the political people that stir stuff up, Trump being probably the worst example, doesn't represent most of us. And when you get down to the details, and I could give you stories where, um, for example, public power here in Syracuse. I mean, we had members of the conservative party, you know, who are basically strongly anti-abortion. And uh, we didn't agree on that, but we did agree that we needed a municipal power utility because the industrial utility is ripping us off and, it, and preventing us from going stronger to renewables. So when you get down to concrete solutions, um, people, despite what they call themselves ideologically, are often going to agree because the practical solution, the interest of the vast majority of us, is often pretty clear. And so I think, you know, particularly in local politics, we can make that happen. And that creates a foundation for fixing what's wrong at the national level. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for the call. Um, and is there anything I can do for you right now, specifically? Um well, you know, keep talking it up. I I, I did read your little uh, blog, was the blog post. My, my guy sent me a link to. Uh, was it the uh, pro Green Party one I posted a couple days ago? I think so. You had three arguments. For, yes. Uh, yeah, vote green in 2020. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That that you know that's I'm only one voice, and it, it becomes a movement with a lot of voices. We're going to have a lot more impact. Thank you so much. I will be uh, contacting Brandon Smith again, or uh, Robert Smith, I'm sorry, uh, and yep. seeing about joining the team possibly and seeing how I can help. I appreciate your time sincerely, and I hope you have a great rest of your day, sir. You too. All right, go Cuse.